Deliberations have begun in the case of a former Minnesota police officer charged with killing Dante Wright. Kim Potter is charged with first and second degree manslaughter for the April shooting. Friday, Potter uh, testified that she mistakenly drew her firearm instead of her taser in the seconds before she shot Dante. In closing arguments today, the defense said, quote, a mistake is not a crime. Here to discuss closing arguments and more are two former prosecutors, BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson and Leslie Ricard Chambers. Glad to see you both here with me tonight. All right, guys, starting with the state's closing argument, let's take a listen to some of that from Aaron Eldridge. We're here because of the defendant's actions, not Dante Wright's. She knew she had a loaded gun on her duty belt a gun that she carried every single day on the job. She carried it on the right side every day for 26 years. And that's the weapon she used. That's the weapon she drew. That's the weapon she pointed. And that's the weapon she fired. Members of the jury, that's culpable negligence and that's reckless handling of a firearm resulting in death. Okay, so the prosecutor uses legal buzzwords, you know, elements that they have to prove for first and second degree manslaughter. Paul, um, boring stuff, but the state has the burden of proof, so it's important that they go through the law for the jury. Yeah, you're correct. And I like how the prosecution laid out a foundation alluding to the fact that there is a higher standard of care for individuals that are carrying around weapons of lethal force. And that translates into a responsibility that is higher for law enforcement and public safety because they carry these weapons that can kill people and mistakes are beyond costly, mistakes are criminal. And they can be criminal when they're in the legal terms that they were using where they're either reckless, which is first degree, or negligent, which is second degree. And that's why you see them weaving in their narrative as they talk about the responsibility and the mistake or the tragedy with those terms to try and lead this jury to understand guilt to hold this officer accountable. Well, she's not an officer anymore, but that's the argument. <laughs> Leslie, your take. And I'll even add to that the concept of the training, her being an officer of 26 years and all of this training that she has undergone all of these years, particularly the training that she went through uh, as it relates to the taser training. Uh, and, and I'll even add just a little bit more to that because we see this video of her uh, pulling out her service weapon, her gun on Dante Wright, and she is saying that she is going to tase him, and she recites this a few times before fatally shooting him, but this video shows that there was no way possible, Yodi, that she felt within, under any reasonable terms, that she had her taser in her hand. The feel of it didn't feel like a taser. The weight of it didn't feel like a taser and the look of it obviously didn't look like a taser. So when you add all of those things together, you can conclude, at least I can conclude, that she acted both recklessly and with culpable negligence as a police officer, a, an officer, supervising officer of 26 years, one that has undergone all the all of this training. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I don't necessarily see uh, the defense's argument, and, and I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I think that it's important for us as we analyze these closing statements that we keep the the the, the, uh, the information or the uh, arguments by the defense in the back of our minds about her mistake, because as the prosecutor said, this was a colossal mistake to make under these circumstances that I just out, outlined. And the jury, I know that they asked for that video to be brought into deliberations. And that's something that they're going to have to consider in terms of whether or not her actions were recklessness as well as culpably negligent. Okay, so Officer Potter, a 26-year veteran, we've heard that time and time again. Both of you have said it in your responses today. Um, and, the spent, and the state spent a lot of time focusing on that and her training. Let's listen to how the prosecution summed that up for the jury. Every year, for 26 years, 
She was trained on how to use her gun and how to use it safely. And every year, for 26 years, she was trained on use of force. And every year, for 19 years, she was trained on using her taser and using that properly. Every year, she saw the PowerPoints. Every year, she was told about the risk of weapon confusion and that pulling a gun instead of a taser could kill somebody. Paul, this is what um, we've talked about last week, uh, that the prosecution needed to make it super stupid simple for the jury and, and trimming the fat so they aren't bogged down with a miscellaneous, you know, like Potter's um, feel-good extracurricular activities. Only the facts and the law matter here. That's exactly correct. And well, I like that they drilled down to unpack that training to re-remind everyone on how much training she actually had how much she was supposedly paying attention to as a contrast to what her actual behavior was. I was expecting for them to go into some of the training that they alluded to, but didn't really drill down on as much about the separate training that she had specifically with tasers. She'd been trained on tasers seven separate times. And so she had training, not just in the lethal force of her weapon, but also on the less lethal force of her taser. And I think that's an important description here to talk about because when we unpack in the context of what she did and her behavior of de-escalation versus escalating the situation, because remember this whole incident came from an air freshener hanging on a rear view window. That's what makes this even more tragic, that this is something that didn't need to happen, but for her behavior, but for her mistake, but for her ignoring the risk, ignoring the warnings, and ignore, ignoring the trainings and even the checks on her weapon from that day. This was a series of casual mistakes that she engaged in that led up to her using her weapon to shoot Dante Wright, and that's what prosecution has to make clear to the jury so that they understand that she should be held accountable. And again, I'm going to say this, that Cops are not supposed to shoot and kill you even if you are guilty, even if you have committed a crime. And so understanding that is the prosecution's job in a case like this to make clear to a broad audience so that we can have a definition of accountability for mistakes like this that raises the standards, not just for this officer, but for law enforcement as well, setting the parameters on what they're not allowed to do and how they should not be allowed to behave when people's lives are at risk as they are every day. And this is all before we even start unpacking race disparities associated with officer-involved shootings, before we start unpacking race disparities associated with interactions with law enforcement, even from simple things like arrest. But that's all in the background. I know we're not talking about race specifically in this case, but those are important things for us to understand as viewers and as an audience to understand the significance of this case and part of why we're having this conversation so that we can learn from Dante Wright. He's gone. He's passed away. But we can learn from this case and from this accountability to build broader accountability and reform into our own communities. Leslie, um, when I heard the prosecutor make this argument, though, I thought that maybe the jurors would think, okay, well, this was the first time something like this had ever happened. I mean, 26 years and not one blemish on her record, never accused or charged with a crime, um, kept up with her training and made this one, albeit very big mistake. But I don't think a jury would want to convict her over it. Well, I am sure that there are some folks who are deliberating in that in that room right now who are thinking the same thing as you are. And I think that the defense wants the jury to lean on that character testimony from those officers, from her peers, who testified that, as you just stated, Yodi, that after 26 years, she has never done anything like this, not even close. And that she's a good person and that, you know, she's got all these great qualities about herself, but that does not negate the fact that she used deadly force, right? And so that's why we are here today. We're here talking about this case because of her use of force. And I, and I want to also uh, highlight the fact that she did not say while she was on the stand 
that she didn't have to shoot him. She did not say, I had to shoot him. In other words, she never concluded to this jury that she had to use this force. And so, you know, that's that's that sort of that's sort of what the prosecution on rebuttal was trying to bring home for this jury that regardless of how you feel about her character, it doesn't mean that she still didn't conduct herself recklessly and that she didn't conduct herself with culpable negligence. All right, guys, we've got more with my panel on today's closing and the question that jurors asked today after the break. Jurors in Minneapolis began deliberations today in the trial of former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter, who could be convicted on the charges of first and second degree manslaughter for the death of Nante Wright during a traffic stop back in April. My lawyers are back with me, Paul Henderson and Leslie Ricard Chambers. All right, guys, now to the defense's closing arguments. Um, attorney Earl Gray hit on three major points. Let's start by listening to why he says the law is on his client's side. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect, ladies and gentlemen. And this lady here made a mistake. And my gosh, a mistake is not a crime. It just isn't. Just, it just isn't in our freedom-loving country that we're going to put you in jail for a mistake you made. A mistake is not a crime, but here's my confusion. Um, Kim Potter thought it was a crime because after she shot Dante, she says, oh my God, I'm going to prison. So that doesn't really make any sense there. Um, it seems the defense is trying to argue two points, that Potter made a mistake, and two, even if she didn't mean to pull the gun, um, she would have been justified in using that gun. Can these two arguments coexist, Paul? Uh, they actually cannot. And I think that this was, this is what it felt like to me, like jury nullification, because it's a nonsensical argument that he was making about this just being a mistake and a mistake is not a crime. That's not actually the state of the law. And if you listen to and pay attention to the jury instructions, you would understand as a jurist that mistakes are sometimes criminally culpable when they are reckless and when they are negligent. That's why the DA keeps harping on it. To me, when the defense attorney got up and was trying to argue something that was counterintuitive to how the law works, it felt like a jury nullification argument of like, this is America, we are free, this is a nice person. They talked about her as being peaceful, as not a bully. And none of that matters when we're evaluating her behavior that actually has real consequences because someone is actually dead. There was a consequence. There was lethal force that was used that should not have been used. And that mistake, however you want to quantify it, should be culpable and there should be accountability for it. And so I, I was frustrated with that argument, but I, I gotta be honest with you, I was more frustrated and insulted by the predictive attack of the victim in this case when they focused on the defense mm -hmm. on Dante Wright was infuriating to me and, and really made me angry listening to it. Which brings me to uh, our next clip that we, I was going to toss to you guys. Here's the next point the defense hit on. If you presume what you have to do, if you presume that she did not cause a death, which you have to do by the presumption of innocence. Did they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she caused this death? No. Dante Wright caused his own death, unfortunately. I don't think that there's a question in terms of who caused whose death. I mean, the question is whether her actions were criminal or not, right? So I, a coroner didn't come into court and testify that Dante died any other way but a gunshot wound to the chest, a shot fired by Kim Potter and no one else. So uh, cause of death is clear. Leslie, your thoughts to that line of argument by, by the defense counsel? Classic victim shame. I mean, it's, it's classic. And and it's also classic for him to try to soften up his client. When at the end of the day, she's the one, the only one, the only officer who pulled out a gun, who pulled out a weapon, period, and not just endangered the life of Dante Wright and the occupants of his vehicle, but also for fellow officers who didn't feel as though uh, that, that, this, that these circumstances should have risen to the level in which Kim uh, Potter took 
uh, this incident. And so not buying it at all, but yes, classic victim shaming. And he seemed to be fumbling around a little bit before, uh, you know, making his disparaging remarks about, about Dante Wright. But look, what is he going to do right? I mean, he's he's got to deflect. And the only deflection that he can do at that point in time is to say that because Dante Wright drove off, he is the one who caused his own death. That's all that he had. Whether they're there to it, uh, it's plausible, it's done, and it's, that is the only he has to his jury at this time. Dante is wrong, but Dante is also deceased, and at the hands of his client, I may add. Well, ironically, the defense then made this point. Take a listen. After hearing and the testimony of Johnson, no question that Officer Potter had a right to use deadly force. Even though she didn't know she was using it, she had a right to. And that's what the law is. That is what the law is. Actually, what I wanted to toss to was the part where uh, the, pro uh, the defense attorney talked about this being a mistake, a simple mistake made um, by Kim Potter and why I say this argument was ironically made uh, after he had just blamed Dante for his own death that if he had just complied with officers that he would be alive, right? But somehow the mistake made by their own client was considered a mistake and that shouldn't cost her life. Paul, your thoughts? Okay, first of all, how dare you was my response and listening to it. When they talked about Dante and what he did, and that here's the language that they said, that they said that he took it upon himself to flee, that he purposefully left the scene, and that was the reason that he is dead. No, sir, he is dead because your client pointed her gun at his chest and shot him in the heart. That's why he is dead. But the argument, the secondary argument that you are alluding to and why it's such a conflict, where they said that she had the right to use the deadly first, that, that is wrong for two levels. First of which, she had no right to use deadly force, even in her own mind. The standard is a reasonable officer, and even her, as the officer in this circumstance, in that fact pattern, as it happened, said out loud, taser, taser. She thought she was tasing and did not think she was using lethal force. But separate from that, and here's the bigger argument that we really have to understand, she escalated this entire situation. You do not get to use use of force that you created for an incident. She escalated this incident into what happened and what unfolded, and then you don't get to make the same argument that I can do anything now in this moment, and then we just look at this snapshot to determine whether or not my use of force is appropriate in this specific incident. You have to look at the entirety of this incident. And again, that brings us back to an air freshener on a rear view mirror. That's how this incident started. And it ended with someone being shot in the chest that she says is a mistake. My argument, and I think prosecution's argument, is that, that mistake is culpable, it's negligent, it is reckless, and you are guilty of this homicide. And uh, Leslie, what I'm also confused by the attorney's um line of argument there is that he's saying that this statute doesn't apply to his client's actions, then if a person's mistakes can't be criminally liable, then when does this, uh, this law apply, if, if not in this case? I have the same question. I'm, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. I mean, who does this law apply to? Because there's a reason why officers are held to a higher standard. And in particular, this officer with all the training with all of her years of experience, uh, uh, her um, field experience, and, and coming into contact with citizens. This is not the first time she's pulled somebody over. I mean, I, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that this is not the first time that she has seen the level of concern on a driver's face that Dante Wright clearly had. I mean, we're talking about a climate in which uh, the George Floyd uh, incident was was happening. The trial was was about to get underway, and it's this young man is concerned 
just as every other black person in this country who drives a vehicle and gets pulled over. Everybody's got the same concern. So you mean to tell me that not only is she out of touch with everybody's reality, with the society's reality and the climate, you also feel as though it is appropriate to pull either weapon, whether it is your gun or it is your taser. And the state is saying that neither reaction, neither weapon was appropriate. The use of force should never have been uh, her go-to response as a way of resolving this particular uh, stop. All right, guys, the jury deliberated for about three hours today and about Halfway through, they asked a question, um, and they sent a note to the judge asking about the date that Kim Potter was interviewed by the psychologist who testified Friday for the defense. Uh, the judge said that since all the evidence was already in, the jury had to rely on their own notes. What can we surmise from that question in terms of the direction these deliberations are going in, Paul? I, I mean, to me, anything that's not focused on her conduct is a distraction to me from what prosecution was arguing. I didn't think that that question was helpful, but, you know, to me, the end of the day, if you as an officer can't understand the difference between a taser and a gun, then you shouldn't have either. Leslie, final word. Probably her state of mind at, at the time after she shot and killed Dante Wright. Uh, but we already know what her state of mind was. She already said it. It's already on video. Uh, I don't see the, I don't see how this is helpful to the jury. All right, Paul Henderson and Leslie Ricard Chambers, thank you so much for your brilliant insight tonight. Appreciate you both.